I'm just going to uh, jump right in, uh, uh, Marva, if that's, if that's all right. Um, uh, I was already mentioning uh, your two publications, and yeah. Building for Hope being the last one. Uh, the other, um, uh, Battle for Home, was much recognized. Um, you are from Homs, you're from Syria. But I just wanted to maybe give you the opportunity to unpack a little bit what is at the core of your publication, a battle, uh, sorry, building for hope. Yeah, just to give the audience some context how the books came into the light. I wrote my first book while uh, was sitting in, in, in my house in the middle of the war in, in Homs, uh, my, my hometown where I was born and based and still living there with my family. And I was studying for my PhD in architectural design at the time and um, the war was the trigger behind the connection, of observing the connection between, uh, between conflicts and between architecture and built environments. So the destruction of my home city was actually the, the motivation behind uh, finding this connection, how the built environment and how architecture and how, we, how the, the design of cities actually play a role in bringing people together or making them fall apart and fall into conflict. Uh, like you said, uh, I was very fortunate that this book was uh, received very well by the international media and that was uh, my ticket out to speak about my work and about my country and about architecture, my vocation, sorry, uh, to the world, to the international audience. Uh, my second book um, was was uh, my response to those visits. So visiting the global uh, cities around the world, one of which is Amsterdam, of course, and many other cities uh, in Europe and Australia, made me also notice that our problems are more interconnected than we would like to acknowledge. And the destruction that happened in my home country, unfortunately, seems very, uh, in a way, eminent, not necessarily with the same, you know, scale on, and, you know, the, the mass destructions that happens in the region. This is something we could, you know, touch upon why there is different and uh, different scales of destruction. But uh, um, our cities today struggle with crises. Mm, I would like to list a few, if you don't mind. Please, yes. So uh, these crises, let's begin by, by, uh, by the housing crisis, for example. A housing crisis is, is all over the world. It's a global, uh, global crisis um, in our region and other, not in the West where so-called developed world, you find um, homelessness. But in our region, you find uh, informalities and slums, uh, favelas, for example, in, in, in Latin America. Uh, but homelessness is also part of the scenery of the European city, unfortunately. Uh, you might think that the housing crisis, you might link it to um, population, increasing population. But what I, what I see uh, is that um, I, see, I see a deeper cause to it, which is the loss of identity and loss of sense of belonging and loss of settlement, which is the premise of, of, of my book. And uh, the second crisis is, uh, is the climate crisis, which is also can be, can be um, seen as part of, uh, um, uh, you know, linked to consumerism. But the question is, what is the drive behind this consumerism? What kind of void uh, it, it, it's replacing or is, is it filling? And uh, the third crisis is, is the violence crisis. We, we notice conflicts and civil conflicts, but we also have uh, gun shooting. We have suicide. We have uh, domestic violence, which are also part of the global scenery. Again, um, people would, you know, experts would link it with economic and political reasons. But in my view, as I see it also, related to this loss of belonging, this loss of home, because this means that there is uh, a social uh, illness, social collapse, and um, a spiritual void as well, that could be the, the, the root of the, uh, the problem. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to touch on that notion of identity uh, after we look at some slides, because then at least we have an idea of, uh, of, of what we are talking about, because you are actually, um, 
wanting to show some of these slides. Yeah. So you can e either instrumentalize me by saying click or next or... Yes. Um, what are we looking at here? So these, these images are from my, my hometown, actually, from Homs. And it's from the, in the old uh, city of Homs. So it's the traditional core of, of the city that wasn't developed or you know, was tr struggling with the, with the, with the re um, regeneration and so-called redevelopment of it. But as you see, um, I, I chose this slide because it's, it's kind of symbolism of what Syria means. Uh, um, the kind of uh, uh, social fabric and kind of uh, juxtaposition of different religions, different backgrounds all together, which is part of the Islamic city, by the way. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's architecturally, for me, it's very, um, very interesting because it, this juxtaposition is not only, uh, is not only um, physical, but also uh, it's social, mm -hmm. and it's something that uh, perhaps not only uh, not all of the world is is uh, aware of, because uh, you hear only about conflicts and about you know sectarianism and tribalism, uh, whereas the truth is is, is it's a, it's a very throughout long centuries. This was the scenery of, uh, of the Syrian city. Yeah, and you, you emphasize a lot that we should be more aware on how architecture affects us. Yeah. We basically lived in a designed environment. I mean, yeah. something if we wrap around our heads that yeah. all the things that we touch and wear are to a certain yeah. extent thought about. But why is it so important for you to emphasize this how architecture affects us. Well, I have a few notes here just to be Would as, you allow me as, to as concise as, as possible because I'm aware of the time. But um, Marwa, um, before you begin, do you mind if I click the next image? No, or? please do. Yeah? So uh, I think, I mean, usually when people ask me how does architecture uh, physically and meaningfully affect us, and I think as um, to, to to be, you know, to make it simple, I think uh, we'll, we'll start from the fact that buildings are public. So uh, buildings are visible and they occupy space. And in that sense, you, you don't need to be an architect in order to react and to understand the building. Building will affect you because it's there. You can see it, you can sense it. And it's oriented and orientational as well. It's, it's facing you. Sometimes it just, you know, it, it directs your movement. It channels where you, you, you want to go, you, where uh, the people you're going to meet, and so on. And also buildings have surfaces and mass and, and textures and apertures, which invites your imagination. And this is also something that all of us interact with because you, you could see you could see a building and say well it looks like uh, so so on and so forth it, it, it seems like it, it's an, an imagine it's an invitation to the imagination and uh, it also involves your memory which is very uh, key point here because uh, a building will remind you of something and that's why we relate to uh, historical buildings, for example. And it involves your senses. So you, you would say it feels like it feels like an, an intimidating building. It feels like a welcoming building. It feels like you know um, a generous building, and so on. And it requires money, which is uh, I, I noticed that it's it's a very um, interesting topic here. It, it is a running thread <laughs> throughout. Yes. Yeah, it requires money to be built, and in that sense, it affects the economy. How do you build it? Who do you invite to be involved in the building process? Is affecting the whole economy cycle and changes the whole economy scenery of your uh, of your city or country. And uh, they function, buildings function, and this means they consume energy and they uh, require maintenance, uh, and this also, uh, uh, also um, affects the economy. Um, the, the, uh, could we stop at this? Uh, of course. At this, uh, yeah. Uh, so it, it, in, in all of these means that there is a relationship between us and buildings. And the optimal result that we hope for is that we love the building. Mm -hmm. So when we love a place, we um, have a sense of attachment, have a sense of belonging, and have a sense of home. And those images you were flickering through are images from my country, from my home city, and from Damascus as well. And I, sh uh, I chose to 
share them with the audience because I thought they represent a destruction that needs translation. Uh, you might not see, you know, uh, images, not yet, images of physical destruction, but f look, for example, at this uh, image. It's an image of chopped down, uh, chopped off uh, olive, olive trees. trees yeah. And it's part of the Damascus Ghuta, which, is the or which are the orchards that used to surround uh, Damascus. And they were the source of not only ledger, but also of food and, and uh, ecological um, uh, pro benefits for the city. And for the sake of building factories, and for the sake of consumerism, and what I call the factory syndrome, uh, they were, uh, the lands were affected by building codes, and they were so sold out, and uh, the ecological, uh, environment was destroyed. Uh, same happens in the next slide, which is uh, which is part of the what was the river in in my hometown in in uh, in Homs, Orentes River, and um, it turned you know it, like many rivers in Syria, it turned into just a stream of polluted water, and this is also related to what I call the factory syndrome, which I. I don't know if we have to, the time to, to, to discuss. Well, I would want you to pick up on this notion that you coin as the ill city. Mm. So, um, like I said, we have so many crises uh, to, to list of the whole, of the whole world. And let's, let's speak about the labor shortages that you and Amsterdam, for example, and Europe in general are struggling with. Uh, you link it to the COVID, to the, to the pandemic, but uh, just take a moment and think, why is it strictly European crisis? The pandemic was, you know, uh, uh, a global pandemic, yet the, the shortages in labor strictly are in the wealthiest parts of Europe. And it's, it's again related to, to how we built our cities, how we chose what kind of eco economy our modern architecture dictated, and how people now uh, have lost, have lost the, the, their sense of attachment, and in, in that sense they lost the um, willingness to uh, get their hands dirty, for example. You have, you, you have a service economy, post-industrial economy, which means that you have to rely on immigration in order to do uh, the, the labor work, you know, the, the blue collar work. Uh, and this is a really dangerous, uh, dangerous turning point in history. I mean, I was, I was listening to all the speakers and obviously we all agree that our world is struggling with so many problems. Uh, but uh, as I discussed in my second book, it's related to the, to the variety of mode of settlements. So we, now we strictly think about settlement in urban terms. And we build for the urban city. And it's the, the mega city that you know, occupies miles and miles of, uh, of land. Whereas if we go past few decades, you know, to the aftermath of the world, world one and two, you would see that there were diverse uh, settlement, modes of settlements, and you had the, the urban, you had the rural, and you had the nomadic. Uh, so, uh, but the way architecture was sold in the aftermath of, of uh, the Great Wars was to, you know, maximize profit, and that's why you had you had it, it, it swiped off the rural rural economy and. It, invited rural immigration into the cities and you ended up with drained countryside versus a very crowded city. Trend that is still going on strongly, right? Uh, the, the prospect that a lot of people are moving to the city is part of this. So what would your, how can we understand this? Is it a decentralized model that you are proposing or how, how can we relate it to your uh, thinking and writing? Well, I, I think it's, it's a cycle, like I said, like Again, it's a, it's a word that we use a lot uh, today, but you have to break a cycle in order to you know, divert the, the path. And I think the place to begin to break the, break the cycle is the countryside, is to reintroduce the rural economy, not the agribusiness, but to give back the land in a way, to, obviously you can't you know, wipe off a whole economy and just you know, uh, replace a whole mode of working and businesses, but in, instead of 
uh, turning the blind eye to what the companies are doing. For example, like Bill Gates now is the biggest owner of, uh, of agricultural land in America. Instead of, you know, just brushing off this fact, be aware that these lands belong to farmers. And those farmers are doing a very uh, monumental uh, task, which is, you know, being dedicated to agriculture. Uh, and um, in that sense, you have to enable this. And the way to enable this is, to, is by rebuilding, is by choosing how to rebuild. And I, I'm sure we don't have time to, uh, to, to tackle this, but I mean, in, in my book, I go back to the Islamic policies of regeneration of the ruralism and also the city. There are two policies that I share in the book uh, that actually have like a blueprint of how to do this. Yeah, so just policy as a way to break the cycle. And I want to return to this notion of identity, mm -hmm. the city of belonging. But before we do that, maybe I can flip through some uh, of these images. Yeah, this is an image also from the city. I can you notice how children, for example, it's always, always good to test architecture to, with children. And you see how they abandoned the block buildings and they went into, into the, the irrigation canal, which is dried out, uh, and they made a slide of it. You might not see it in a European city because you have like public parks and it's, it's something to be celebrated, of course, but when architecture becomes a com commodity mm -hmm. and real estate uh, globally happen, becomes a commodity as well, a trade, you will end up at the end, you will end up with sceneries like this. Uh, this is also from the countryside of Syria. It's threatened by, believe it or not, by tourism as you know, as Amsterdam is threatened by tourism and New York and, and, and London. Um, it's, I mean, it's, I, I think it's uh, greener than most of <laughs> Western audience would, uh, would stereotypically think, but it's, uh, with the rate of building, you might, you know, uh, see it as, as deserted as you would imagine it. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to make a jump to uh, a more destructive image because this is, of course, also reality. Yeah. Um, this is an image taken by a German uh, journalist. I was with him in Homs. His name is Chris Werner. And he took this image of a completely destroyed neighborhood in, uh, in Homs. Homs is 60% like this. Uh, still till today? Still till today. Still standing as it is, pancaked as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the reason we bring these up before we go to one of your projects is, in fact, I would want to question, is there an ethics in rebuilding? Uh, we're witnessing the Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia at the moment. Well, you have your own relationship to uh, the, the, the Russians. The question I'm trying to pose is, um, to what extent can we learn from other conflicts and the other question I want to pose is that there's a lot of solidarity in the European um, uh, hemisphere when it comes to the Ukraine, yet it's possibly also lacking a little bit for the region uh, you are from, or thinking of Yemen or Palestine, or how, how do you deal with this acknowledgement? Well, obviously, for someone who lived through war for like a decade, and, and I cannot have but empathy for anyone who's, you know, going through the, the experience of war. It's, it's something that nobody should go through. Uh, but also, I also see the double standards sometimes, or the hypocrisy of media, of, you know, sh shedding a light on, uh, on one specific place and forgetting the others. I would like to see, you know, it, I would like to see that all of our wars are treated with the same empathy that it, they, they deserve to be. Like you said, in, in Yemen, in Lib Yemen is a forgotten tragedy. Nobody speaks about Yemen. And Yemen is, is being destroyed every day. They are dealing with cholera, in, in, and it's a great civilization. Yet, nobody speaks about it in Palestine as well, in, in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, I think it's related to the colonial legacy in a way that the West somehow uh, find it difficult to relate to to this part of the world because uh, because colonization actually created a whole lot of mess at, in this in in these countries yeah. and it's easier to think of them as you know as deserts and the place of death and destruction than to genuinely 
uh, re-acknowledge and think about the problems that were created and why they maintain to be created till this day. Yeah, we have a, uh, the last minute left for the um, project you wanted to bring to us, because yeah. to me it also, in the photograph that you shared with the young gentleman, the boys appropriating the landscape to a certain extent, yeah. this is also a, a gesture, um, I would say, because of course we also talk about scale, where to begin. Yes. Uh, so, one minute, <laughs> it's, a, it's a project that uh, I did uh, with Brighton Festival, a festival that I was co-guest directing uh, in, in the last two weeks, I guess. Uh, uh, and uh, I was commissioned with my husband, uh, our studio was commissioned to do a, a pop-up structure, a temporary structure uh, for a lawn uh, on the Sea Hove. And the motivation behind the design was to reconnect the city that was separated from from the beach, so um, we chose a uh, we chose a concept that is uh, um, from our own Islamic culture as well, which which is the colonnade. We call it uh, in Arabic it's uh, the riwaq, uh, and the riwaq, uh, riwaq is is a transitional space. So the colonnade is is the place that you find juxtaposed to the building. You have the enclosed building, you have the open space, and you have the semi semi open. Uh, colonnade beside it. So it's a transitional space and the theme we chose for for uh, the festival was rebuilding and exchange and it was you know it was our response to to the idea of exchange between and connection between the city and the beach and the way the feedback of, from the people it just you know it was so humbling so amazing from the people who built up the, the structure, the, the workers, they were just, you know, saying thank you for this and, and it's be beautiful. I mean, the word beautiful is just, you know, it's, it's, it's key here because we relate to beauty, we love beauty. And uh, I have just uh, to say that, you know, I was, I was most happy with the reaction of children because they just ran through and one reporter asked a child, what do you think of it? And she said, it's beautiful, I love it. And the other testimony was, testimonial was from a drunken man, homeless man, who was, yeah, who, was, who came up to, to one of the directors and he said, you know what, I didn't pee on this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to end on uh, the word P. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he said because it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, we, could, we could end up on beauty. So we could end up on beauty because I want to thank you very much for uh, sticking, um, uh, yeah, being also, I would say, an, a, a mediator between worlds. Uh, and it was way too short. And for those of you who are now intrigued, there's tons of beautiful lectures online. So please check out. Marwa Al Sabudi. Please, thank you. Thank you.